Hi, thank you so much. I'm Dr. Becky White, and I'm from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm going to be given the keynote address. And I just wanted to thank you very much for inviting me. Um, a little bit about me. I'm an infectious disease physician. I'm an active clinician. And like a lot of infectious disease physicians during this past year and a half, I've been more active clinically than I ever have had. And it feels like since residency, given the coronavirus epidemic. But I also um, and I'm, I'm an academic researcher. And I also provide on-site care in the North Carolina State Prison System, and I've done this for about 25 years. And my entire academic career has been caring for underserved HIV populations in the South. And I also am an, I'm an African-American female Southerner. So I think I bring a unique perspective given all of these different aspects of who I am. And hopefully, given that, I can try to integrate and synthesize a lot of the information from my perspective. So the objectives of this presentation are to number one, describe challenges for minorities to engage in healthcare in the United States. I also wanna describe ways that providers can better serve minority populations. I also wanna describe individual and systemic interventions that can help minorities successfully engage in HIV care. I think um, given all of the issues and the events that have affected African-Americans, I wanna focus on African-Americans um, for this presentation. And I think for, for everyone, but especially African-Americans, this has been a really rough couple of years. And you can see in this slide, George Floyd, um, the Black Lives Matter movement, and of course, the current COVID-19 epidemic. So first I wanna talk about ending the HIV epidemic. Ending the HIV epidemic, I think most of you have heard of this, the EHE. Um, this um, is a federal effort to, um, to end HIV as we know it. And the goals are to diagnose, treat, protect, respond in a regionalized fashion. The largest goal is to reduce new HIV infections by 75% in five years and 90% in 10 years, okay? And so you can see, we wanna diagnose all people with HIV as early as possible. We wanna treat the infection rapidly and, and effectively to achieve sustained viral suppression. We also wanna protect people at risk for HIV using potent and proven prevention interventions, including PrEP a medication that can prevent HIV infections. And we want to respond rapidly to detect and respond to growing HIV clusters and prevent new HIV infections. And we wanna have an HIV health force that will establish local teams committed to the success of the initiative in each jurisdiction. And so by 2030, we want to end this domestic HIV epidemic. So how are we doing? And this is a slide, um, the most recent slide by the CDC on HIV in the United States in 2018. And for every 100 persons with an indication for PrEP, about 18 were prescribed for PrEP. And there are profound disparities if you look in terms of racially, um, for in terms of women, in terms of uh, black MSMs. We're doing better um, as we look further down in the slide. For every 100 persons with, um, with HIV, 86 um, have received a diagnosis. So that is better. We'd like to get it to 100, 100 of course. Um, we fall off in terms of getting into care. And so that goes to, from, that goes to 65. And once in care, actually people do better. 
Um, it says 50 were retained in care and 56 were virally suppressed. But if you look at the people that are actually in care, this is a, this, these numbers are a lot better. And a lot of these numbers um, reflect people who are out of care. And what about the diagnosis in African-Americans? So, so African-American people account for a higher proportion of new HIV diagnosis. And people with HIV compared to other races and ethnicities. In 2018, African-Americans accounted for 13% of the United States population, but 42% of the new HIV diagnosis in the United States in dependent areas. And where I live um, in the South, the majority of individuals are diagnosed and, and most individuals with HIV live. HIV is one of the largest health disparities in the United States. And so if you look among African-American individuals, most new diagnoses are among men, and they're among men who have male-to-male -male sexual contact. Um, heterosexual contact would be number two, um, injection drug use, and then combined. And among women, it's mostly heterosexual contact. Okay, but what about trends? So there, um, so if you look in general among African Americans, there are some uh, decreases. And so if you look at on the, if you look at trends by sex, if you look among men from two, if you look at men, you see a decrease um, from 2014 to 2018. You see a decrease in diagnosis, 6%. Women, it's a lot greater. If you look at trends by age, you see all ages, there's been a decrease in diagnoses from 2014 to 2018, with the exception of 25 to 34. And that's the only group in which diagnoses have been increasing. So next, I wanna describe challenges for minorities to engage in healthcare in the United States. And so, what I did is I, I reviewed the literature and I thought about what I've seen over the past 25 years and even longer because before that I was in my training. And there are many ways you can actually cl um, classify um, these challenges and many frameworks. And so I decided to, um, to use more of an ecological framework, policy, community, practice, provider, and patient. And so if we look at, um, policy challenges for African-Americans um, to engage in HIV care, lack of health insurance is huge. And especially if you're talking about states without Medicaid expansion, okay? It's very challenging. And where I am in North Carolina in the, in the South, it's a very, very challenging. Also, African-Americans, male and female, are disproportionately impacted by the criminal justice system. And these are the individuals that I see, whether it's incarceration in jail, prison, on parole, probation, or community corrections, which are really uh, probably a very growing area. And so by these individuals impacted by the criminal justice system and part of it, um, when they are released, they still have, real, have a lot of challenges integrating into the community. And there are actually, uh, there are a lot of laws that bar them from employment, um, from living, certain living places uh, where they live, um, and um, so these are challenges. In the community um, which African-Americans live, um, we often have a lack of resources to really help us engage in the care. And for many of us who are diagnosed with HIV, um, there is a lot of social stigma to not only just HIV, but the testing itself, um, homophobia, transphobia. And some communities really have a challenge in terms of social capital, especially resource, especially communities that have really been impoverished. Um, and so there's lots of challenges. And what about the healthcare systems that uh, African-Americans use? Well, as you know, um, healthcare systems in general are consolidating and getting larger and larger. And they've become more and more um, running, run like businesses. And so there's a lot of challenges in terms of payments. A lot of times when it was smaller, um, there were a lot, of, a lot of times more lenient on the co-pays. But I think all of us know what, what has happened now that it's 
Uh, there's so many rules in terms of copays that African Americans find really challenging, just even accessing our own organizations where where we work. The other thing is that um, African Americans, and it doesn't matter if you have HIV or not, in general, if you look at the places where they receive care, they tend to be a uh, lower quality of care. Uh, and many of our journals have um, have really shown this in a lot of publications. So the just the 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 the, the care is poor in in the criminal justice system um, in in correctionals. Uh, the care was low quality and it's gotten so much better, but there are still challenges. And what about the providers? What about people like me? Well, there are a lot of issues with the providers that care for HIV. Uh, probably the most obvious is that number one, most of the providers don't look like them. They're not, they don't share the same culture. Um, they don't come from the same community. Uh, many of them uh, didn't go to the same schools, neighborhoods. And so there is serious, there's some, a serious distance between the folks who care for um, Black patients and the patients themselves. And many, um, um, th there's a term in terms of cultural competency, many of you may be familiar, but even that there are issues in terms of just understanding things that are culturally relevant. And then the patients themselves, which we weren't, well, we won't really talk much about in terms of the patients themselves, but patients um, themselves have a lot of challenges, their health behaviors, attitudes, beliefs, knowledge, have a lot of comorbidities. Um, and of course, employment, health insurance, and a profound lack of trust, and not just in the healthcare system, but really in this country. The, um, there was a very important Institute of Medicine um, uh, proceedings, and uh, it was called Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare. Uh, and it's really good. Um, and they actually had quite a bit on HIV. And they actually had some recommendations and um, at the time. And these recommendations including, included that we needed to utilize data and, and to determine um, the disparities in terms of race and ethnicity. We need to um, use evidence-based guidelines and quality improvement. We um, need to increase the proportion of underrepresented minorities in healthcare workforce. We need to integrate cross-cultural education into the training of all healthcare professionals. And we need to con conduct further research to identify sources of disparities and promising interventions. And so when I looked at that, I said, these are the same things now I'm hearing um, again. And I wonder if any of those um, I wonder if any of those recommendations have been fully implemented. So what are ways that providers can better serve minority populations? And again, I'm gonna be focusing on black populations at this point. Um, this is the stock picture that you see on diversity. Um, and I've called, this is the uh, picture of diverse models. I don't know where they all work, but I would like to work there. They seem very happy. Um, they certainly look good. But I think from thinking about diversity and thinking about things that we can do, I think the, one of the things is we really need to diversify at every level. And what, I'm, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I think obviously is what I just kind of talked about or hinted at is we really need to um, increase our numbers of um, of racially ethnic minorities in healthcare and in our workforce. And this has really been um, recommended for a long time. And I think that, uh, I think that um, uh, most people understand having, if you're a patient, having individuals who look like you, who share the same culture, um, is extremely important. And there's, a, there's evidence that uh, communication is better. And then there's, um, and then there's, um, um, evidence that the the um, that the quality of the communication and of course trust. Again, I'm not trying to say that um, if you're not of the same race, you can't provide good quality of care because you can. And and I get I get my uh, I get good quality of care um, from my doctors who many are not my same race or gender, 
But I do think we need to make the effort to um, increase the diversity. The other thing I think it's important to do is to diversify the leadership. And I, I don't see, hear this enough. And I mean leadership in a very broad way. Um, we know that where we work, there's office staff, nursing assistants, case managed managers, nurses, physicians, social workers. And all of these individuals, um, who are individuals of color, often African-Americans, really need to feel that they have a path to leadership and a path for advancement. Because if they are really engaged in terms of the decision-making, I think they can, we can better serve our community. So how do we do this? Um, baby boomers, um, I'm a member of Generation X, uh, but to our baby boomers who've done such a great job, you're my teachers, you're my mentors, you continue to help me, but you've really been in leadership for a long time. And I think it'd be great if many of you would step down or at least decrease the number of jobs. Uh, I, I have colleagues who are baby boomers who have 15 leadership jobs or 10 leadership jobs. And this is, and I can say at least in academia, we see this all the time. And so I think that um, we really need to diversify the leadership. Um, for African-Americans especially, many of us, given everything that has happened, um, have really looked at ourselves and have looked at where we've been working. And we've, we've been thinking, is this the best place for us? Is this where we really should be, given all of the challenges? And I think we should really think about that. Um, and I think we should, we ourselves should demand better for ourselves. And we should, if we're not being offered leadership jobs or whatever jobs that you feel that you should have, we need to step up. And if we're not getting what we need, we need to look at other places. And I think this is something very important. And I don't think we need to be perfect. I think that's another thing. And, and women have the same issue where they think they have to be perfect. Um, and I think that um, experiences make you better. And um, so I think that African-Americans, we need to step up. I think it's important to have a very diverse staff and supported staff that feels valued, that's gonna be good for your patients, they will be able to serve the patients better and that they will engender trust. In order to do this, you're gonna to have to track, you're gonna to have to track your diversity and you're gonna to have to hire people, folks in leadership positions who don't just say, I care about diversity, but have track records of promoting diverse individuals. The second thing that I, I think that we need to do as providers is we need to increase testing. And testing, um, and I think a lot of us have thought about testing uh, given this coronavirus epidemic, and there are some parallels. First of all, testing should be easy. And, and we know now that we have recommendations by all the major guidelines, CDC, United States uh, Preventive Task Force recommend, recommend routine testing but it doesn't happen enough and it doesn't happen often enough. So if we increase HIV screening, we're gonna increase identification. We're gonna normalize testing. We're gonna reduce stigma. And this is gonna benefit our, our patients. It's gonna get them into the healthcare system earlier. Um, we're gonna be able to reach our goals of ending the epidemic. But how do you do it? Well, I think that in many in people on your panel discussion, and I've, and I've seen some of your other speakers, they've actually done research on this, and, and I have as well. And first of all, to make these things happen, you need to automate it. And um, you have to uh, have reminders. You have to have systems in place. It's not enough to, to tell providers they need to test. And providers, when I say need to test, I mean everywhere, beyond primary care, emergency rooms, mobile testing sites, et cetera. Um, but you often have to nudge providers. And so for example, if you want get, you could take, if you wanna get people uh, tested for coronavirus, instead of making them call on the phone, stay on the internet forever, um, is to actually send them, send them an appointment and schedule the appointment in advance. Um, and so that's uh, the term would be for HIV screening would be opt out screening where you're going to be tested unless you tell us that you don't want want to have testing. Um, so you, I don't think it's good to just put it on the doctor. 
it has to be part of the system. And um, interventions that have done these have really increased testing. Third, I think we need to have um, community uh, partnerships. And the term, um, I've always heard community engagement. I've not really known what it means. To me, it's just, it, it, at the, you know, when I first heard it, I, you know, had a vague understanding. But I have now been reaching out in the community, mainly because a lot of our patients I see in the prison system, they do very well in the prison system, but when they leave, they don't do well. And so we've been thinking, well, what are we really doing? We've been happy because they do so well in prison, but if the overall that they don't do well, um, it's making us really kind of rethink what we're doing. And so we've really been reaching out to the community and really working with them on what ideas that they have and what do they think uh, things, would, things would work. And I just recently, with a proposal I'm working on now, had a, had a great meeting with someone from the community. And you know, one thing that she said is she said, um, and she um, is in charge of a community-based organization. And she said, you know, often, um, and she's talking about academics, that at the last minute they'll call and say, oh, we wanna work with you. And she said, and, and I felt like she was gonna tell me I was at the last minute. But one thing she said, which was good, and I felt better, is I was part of an organization that had been working with them for the past two to three years, and there was already such trust. And she had just great ideas and went back and forth. And she's really going to make not only the proposal uh, better, but the intervention better. So I would kind of go beyond community in, um, partnerships. I would say community teams. And we really need to be um, um, in teams with um, our community members. Um, I also think that it's important. Um, so I think innovations are important, and prep is a very uh, um, is 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 um, has been really a major innovation over the past couple of years. But the issue is, most of us know that when you have a, any new innovation in healthcare, you actually worsen disparities. And it takes a long time, especially for marginalized populations, which Blacks um, often are part of, not all, but are part of these populations. And, and often the individuals that need, need this innovation the most are least likely to get it. And one of the issues, as I was thinking about it, I remember when, when I was in a clinical trial class, I remember my professor was talking about um, doing a clinical trial and he was talking about medication. And he said, you need to pick people who will be adherent to your drug. If you don't, you won't find out if the drug works or not. And so I often think in terms of clinical trials, we'll often pick people who we think will um, uh, be the best to take the medications. Now, there's a lot of problems with that. Number one, uh, I would say as a physician, physicians are the worst at at predicting, predicting adherence to any medications. There's a lot of literature on that. But also the other issue is that we um, perpetuate disparities um, by picking and choosing who should be in studies and who should not. Um, and that's why we really need to have a broad, a broad way. And we should really try to support individuals. And, and that means we have to design our studies differently. Again, working with the community. And I think individuals in the community um, will have a lot of ideas and so again, not designing the study and then talk to the community, but really be engaged from the very beginning. And I think if we can do that with innovations, we can make sure our, our, um, the patients that need it the most have access um, um, as well. I think telehealth and all of us in terms of the, since because of the coronavirus epidemic, it has probably been the, the major thing that has really made us um, um, embrace telehealth and telehealth is now here to stay. It was by necessity. And I will have to be admit that um, I was slow on telehealth. I mean, I, I am old school. I like uh, I like face-to-face -face contact. I like working with nurses and being in the office. Um, I, um, you know, um, I didn't, uh, I, you know, I, for me, I thought I'm, I'm a doctor. I'm not an, I'm not an IT person, but I will say from the patient's perspectives, they really, um, and especially many of my black underserved patients, they really um, said that this has been a, a great thing in the prison system. And they've used a telehealth in the prison system, um, but we had not really embraced it until, until we had to, when um, we essentially shut down our on-site 
uh, prison clinics during coronavirus, and we continue to, to do that, that it was amazing. We had patients who would refuse to clinic um, because of the long drives to the prison clinic. And it was amazing how we saw patients for the first time that we hadn't seen in a while. And the same patients who are being released are telling me that, that they're having such a hard time following up after release. And they told me, yes, if we had telehealth, we, we could definitely follow up. And almost everyone has access to a phone and almost everyone knows how to use a phone. And uh, if you don't use a phone, just ask a kid. Uh, and there's such emerging technology with telehealth, especially in cardiology, where they can literally diagnose arrhythmias. And so I think that now we are here, I think that in terms of telehealth, I think that we should um, continue to push because I think that this will help our patients um, who have so many barriers to care, uh, especially where I live in the South, where so many, where we have um, quite a few people who are in rural areas with really poor access to, to HIV providers and they have to, and as well as poor access to transportation. And so with telehealth, they're gonna be able um, to continue care. So I also wanna describe individual and syst um, syst um, systemic interventions that can also help minorities successfully engage in HIV care. And I've talked about um, some of them as well. So I think that um, as I'm gonna mainly discuss structural interventions, um, I'm gonna really um, recommend ending racism. And I think this is really important. Um, and I probably wouldn't have put this up a couple of years ago, because I would have thought this is almost impossible. But I really realized that just because things are impossible or hard, we should still strive and we can be better. And maybe we can really do this. But I think this is really, really important. And I've been and I have begun to be educated on ways um, to do this. And so many communities now are engaged. Um, there's community resources. Most of your institutions have some type of resources, but I think all of us should try to be engaged in some type of anti-racism activity. And especially I, I would use the term verb um, instead of, um, I think diversity statements are fine. Um, we are required to now write a diversity statement, but I think we have to go beyond the statements to actually some type of action. And I think that all of us can do something um, to try to end, end racism. And I think this will really help our patients. Um, next, I think uh, expanding Medicaid. And I live in a non-Medicaid expansion state. And um, as I think about um, individuals um, in terms of getting individuals access to PrEP uh, and, and just access to medications, um, so many of the patients that I see um, who, especially males, when I talk to them about PrEP, um, many of them, the first question they ask is, how am I gonna pay for it? How am I gonna pay for the meds? How am I gonna pay for the co-pays? And, and basically the conversation stops there. They're not even gonna access, access or even discuss it um, given the, given the um, financial issues. So I think expand, Medicaid expansion in the non-Medicaid expansion states would be a game changer. And I think the lack of this has really been a policy that has really hurt um, um, individuals in the Southern states, particularly African-Americans. Um, also, I think that um, as we're still in the middle of a, you know, an opioid epidemic, I think ap real um, access to um, substance um, abuse um, and use treatment is really important. And um, I think that this is something all of us have known that it's important. And I think there are some more resources that are available, not enough, but I think we really need to do all that we can to um, have our patients engaged in some type of substance um, abuse treatment. And there are right now, there are medications that are now increasingly available um, our own prison system now is really now engaging in, in um, this, which is to me really um, 
um, I'm really um, happy that they're doing this. And so if the prisons who are tend to be not always cutting edge, um, if they are engaging, I think really all of us should be. So basically um, really engaging in substance use treatment for, to help our patients. Um, again, just to uh, discuss diversity, I think again, it's very important and um, increasing our workforce. And I think that there are things that all of us can do to increase the diversity of our workforce. A lot of us in the HIV epidemic are aging and um, individuals have reached out to us sometimes, we're busy. And I will um, have just thought of um, some students who really wanted to um, work with us um, in our prison telehealth program. And, um, you know, we've been busy, it's not gonna be easy, we've gotta get permission. But after doing this presentation, I had to think about, well, what about me? What am I not doing? And this is something I will definitely do. And this is my action step, is to really um, contact with contact them and try to get them to be a part of, um, our tele of providing um, telehealth and at least working with us where we're able to kind of model um, care for underserved populations, and hopefully, hopefully we can get them interested in terms in terms of HIV. Um, many of us know in infectious disease that there is a um, HIV workforce sh shortage. Uh, there have been less and less individuals um, interested in infectious diseases. Um, some say with coronavirus that will increase. I'm not so sure, um, but the HIV, but there are less and less um, individuals. Um, and really, uh, we have very few uh, residents that are interested. Now, our medical students are interested in the underserved. And this, to me, my experience has been a big change over the past 20 years. And they really seem interested. And most of them, uh, 20 years ago, um, were not trying to come to the prison at all. But I've had so such an interest in the past five years. And I think that they are ripe for um, for involvement with the underserved populations. And I think that we should do all we can to encourage them and be role models to them and, and show them um, how rewarding it is and how you can really help people in terms of this care. So in summary, these are uh, structural and um, individual ways that we can engage our patients into care, um, Medicaid expansion, coverage for PrEP, um, sub uh, a syringe uh, exchange policies, um, also rev revision of criminal justice policies I don't think I talked about. Um, healthcare systems, we need to increase resources for infectious disease programs and HIV programs. Um, in our community, we need to reduce homophobia, transphobia, reduce stigma. Again, none of these things are new things that you don't know about, but we as providers, we need to really increase our HIV workforce and we need to increase the racial ethnic uh, diversity. And as our patients are doing well and living longer, we're gonna need providers who are, can provide HIV care as well as, um, as, well as care for their uh, comorbidities as well. Um, and all, and for our patients, we should do all we can uh, to increase screening and to increase PrEP awareness. And I think all of these things are gonna, going to increase trust um, that our patients have for us, um, as well um, as the healthcare systems that we're a part of. Again, this is um, a um, this is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This is a slide I got from their website on equality and equity. And I think many of you have seen this before. And so there's a lot of, in our country, we talk about equality, but we need equity and everybody doesn't need the same thing. And some people need more help. And um, we've got to figure out ways to help individuals. And I know so many people who are listening to this have We've got to figure out ways to help individuals without burning ourselves out. And so we need to involve a whole community and involve our systems in doing this. Um, and do, when you do these things, and I've seen this, patients can have equal outcomes. 
Thank you so much. And I appreciate and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.